Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. Where we continue to follow the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden now. Those are just some of the scenes overnight as thousands of Americans gathered in celebration of Osama bin Laden's death. Former Navy SEAL Rob O'Neill says he has thought about the mission every day since that May Day in 20. From multiple conversations you had with Rob O'Neill over the past year and a half, how did you get And you described that his head kind of exploded yes, when you hit I, him. Yes, I actually hit him three times because I shot him twice when he was standing and once on the ground. That is the fucking American badass. Go, go, go. We are not going for fame and we are not going for bravado. We are going for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday morning and then 45 minutes later she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper. If you need help, hang up and then dial your operator. I'm Rob O'Neill, and this is the Operator Podcast. Welcome back to the Operator Podcast. We did take a little bit of time off for a few reasons that you might have seen or may not have seen, Um, but we're still working on that right now, making a few adjustments here and there in life. And uh, I guess it's proving one of those points that life happens around you as you're trying to make the perfect plan. Sometimes you make a plan and other things happen. And uh, that is that. Um, What I wanted to bring up today is uh, think about your darkest secret. Think about something that you do that's shameful that uh, no one really knows about and you don't brag about. Stuff that you do when the doors are locked. Or whatever you know what I'm talking about. We're all we're all uh, we're all there with something. Uh, my dark secret just happened to get blasted all over the world, and that's uh, that's something that I don't wish upon anybody. Whenever anything that I do, well, not anything that I do. Whenever I I do something that I shouldn't have done, it gets blasted all over the internet, and uh, a lot a lot of people like to um, talk about it, read about it, and then they also. Um, um, <laughs> if you're looking for what did Major Payne say? If you're looking for sympathy, go to the dictionary and, and search between shit and syphilis. Uh, people on the internet don't care about your feelings, so if you're looking for sympathy, call a family member. Don't go on Twitter. Whatever, it's all good. But but a lot of people on those, not not just the bots, but other people, like to glorify themselves based on your failures. It's like the whole thing. If we can bring you down. Uh, or some, whatever. But mine got blasted all over the world. You know what mine is now. Um, sometimes, and this has been an issue, uh, I, I try to numb some of the pain uh, with drinking vodka. And it's not like uh, the fun the fun times going out when you're young or you know when you're in high school, college, or a young Navy SEAL, a young soldier, a Marine. Uh, this is just more of a, I want to drink to get rid of the pain. It's not like I'm out there, the occasional... Um, the occasional shot in between drinks here and there, just having fun, yelling, screaming, going home responsibly. This is just more of a um, – it's, it's kind of like the opening scene in Leaving Las Vegas when Nick Cage has the shopping cart in the store, and he's like laughing his ass off as he walks down the aisles, and he's putting every kind of booze he can find in the shopping cart. And at first, it seems sort of funny, like, wow, this guy's planning for a party. Turns out, no, he's trying to drink himself to death. Uh, and it's not, that movie turns out to be, it's not a fun movie. If you're looking to get entertained, I would not watch Leaving Las Vegas. I'd probably watch Shrek or something like that. Any, basically, almost anything with Eddie Murphy doing a voice or being in himself would be good. But I've been doing this for a while. And uh, it, it's, it is one of those things where you, you can, um, the only way you can fix yourself is by admitting it at first to yourself. And that doesn't mean you're going to do it alone, but the, the process of trying to fix yourself is the realization that that um, you can ask for help and it's okay. And and what I've been finding out lately with what happened in Texas is um, is is a lot. Of, some positives did come out of it. I, I have had a lot of Navy SEALs reach out to me, a lot of uh, veterans reach out to me. And it's sort of one of those things where almost we don't really talk about it, but a lot of people have the same problems. And uh, they did ask for help. And I've, I've done it before, but I'm, I'm going to go get some of the, um, not in more intense, but the, the more training, the more therapy that has more longevity and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm definitely going to let you know 
how it goes. But yeah, the 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 horrible um, thing about this, the horrible truth, because you can only you can only lie to yourself for so long. You're gonna you're gonna <laughs> the horrible truth is once you hit rock bottom, there's one way to go, right? And that's back up. And I'm a huge believer in in if you if you make mistakes, you got to learn from them and move on. You can't dwell on them because you're not getting the play back. And it's that simple. I, as much as I would love to go back and get rid of it, hitting rock bottom is uh, is something that's you know is making me learn. We got to move up. And there's I can't get into the uh, specifics of what exactly went on yet because they're still working it down there, and I don't want to get in the middle of it. But uh, you may have seen some of the pictures. They um, uh, yeah, they took a few. So. <laughs> Uh, that's the, I'm not making light of it, and I'm not trying to blame anybody but myself. Uh, that happens, and um, we got to move on. But like, rock bottom for me was was calling my wife from jail, and not only that, but realizing I didn't know her number. So they let me look at her number. They actually let me write it down. I still have that piece of paper here with her number on it. And then they put me, uh, they put me, you know, in you, you're gonna you're gonna wait in a holding cell or whatever. And I I. Uh, I repeated to myself, not a lot to do when you're in a cell by yourself. I don't know if you know that. I hope you never find that out. But what I did is I repeated her phone number. I counted, too. I was counting because I've mentioned before on certain missions uh, that when it when it gets boring, because a lot of combat is 98% of boredom and then 2% of excitement. Uh, and I learned for through some of the boredom, like helicopter rides or Humvee rides or even offsets that take two and a half, three hours to walk into a certain spot. If you can count, uh, that helps. So I counted myself saying her number out loud 1,300 times before I stopped. So I know her number now, which is which is good. And I just hope there's never a position where I need to ask the um, the officers working, can I see her number again? I, I, I hope I'm not there again. But that was another another positive thing too. Is that I did get to meet a lot of great cops, a lot of great uh, administrative folks working the civilian sector. I mean, you know, try to make what my little sister Kelly says: uh, when life gives you a lemon, just blow them out your ass. But you know, that's the best you can do with that. And I met some great people there. But uh, I was, you know, I like to do studying. I like to stay up on current events. This isn't going to affect what I talk about on this podcast because I do want to talk to you, get feedback from you. Hell, ho- I hope one day you can be a guest on this. But for now, throw some comments in Instagram at The Operator Podcast, at Makuya, M-C-H-O-O-Y-A-H. Even on Twitter, I will check occasionally, but you know how that Twitter goes. Um, but I, um, And again, that, that's what The Operator Podcast is. Um, me telling you my opinion, getting your feedback, and seeing what you think and coming to a conclusion together. What this has helped me realize, and this is episode 60, like I said, thanks again for being with me, is uh, you may have noticed, and I'm guilty, uh, we're all guilty of stuff, but I'm guilty sometimes of getting too negative with people. Like I mentioned, sometimes when you're yelling at your phone, you're not, you don't think there's a real person there. You're yelling at your phone, and that's it. Um, but you know, once it hits, it kind of hits, and you're like, yeah, this, this sucks. Um, so I'm going to do my best from now on to instead of just being critical and and having negative t- things to say about people i will point out what i think is wrong or right and then hopefully come up with what i think would be a good solution and then there can be a decent retort to that and that's how you start a debate instead of just locking yourself in a room with the people who say yes uh the whole if you're the toughest man in the room you're in the wrong room but what I was studying too, and if, if you look, the, again, the realization that people are people and we are flawed. Uh, I, I heard a, an interview with Tucker Carlson. I hope you know who Tucker Carlson is. And I think he's a smart guy. I've met Tucker quite a few times. I really like him. But he came out with something that said uh, something along the lines of, I'm going to quote him here in a second, but what I was, what I was uh, getting out of it was public humiliation is a good thing because it keeps you grounded. And it will remind you that you're human. And what Tucker said about this is um, he would really recommend getting fired. He said that men in particular need to be humiliated fairly regularly and suggested that his ego was out of control at the time he was fired. So he was fired from Fox um, for the Dominion stuff that he was saying on his on his uh, kick-ass primetime show. Now he's on X, which used to be Twitter. I said Twitter earlier. I meant X, whatever that is. But uh, he also said, I'm reading his quotes here, 
This is the third time I've been fired as an adult, and I would really recommend it to anybody. It's great to get fired because it keeps you from being a truly horrible person. The problem with men when they're successful is they start to think they're Jesus. It just happens. And um, that's, I mean, that's what he said. Getting, getting, re- getting fired reminds you that no, you're just like everybody else. Being humiliated is not the greatest learning experience. It's the only learning experience, at least for men. Men need to be humiliated fairly regularly to keep their souls pure. Now, the humiliated thing cracks me up because it reminds me when I mentioned some of your deepest, darkest, embarrassing secrets. You might be into something else. And, uh, you know, sometimes ball gag is a good um, punchline. But he, uh, he, he said, Tucker said that uh, the firing has kept his hubris in check and reminded him that he is just kind of a ridiculous person who will eventually die alone and terrified like every other human being since the beginning of time, which to me is a little bit morbid as well. But that was, I mean, that's Tucker. I'm quoting Tucker. And uh, I do like listening to Tucker. I'm trying my best to listen to every point of view. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm like, a lot of people, I, I know I'm right, but I'm also doing my best to be willing to listen. And um, yet again, I can't get into specifics. I did mention the positives. Guys I haven't talked to in years. It was great to hear from uh, other Navy SEALs with with positive stuff. Saying, You know what else I noticed, too, is that a lot of people are struggling with some stuff like this. A lot of, a lot of combat vets are struggling with post-traumatic stress, a lot with traumatic brain injury. Now, I've mentioned before that you do not need to be a combat veteran to have suffered from post-traumatic stress. I think we've all had trauma at some point, and uh, I'm not getting into what kind of training I'm going to just yet, but I will tell you all about it if you'd like, and we'll see if I see a a change. Hopefully. I I think so. Everyone – the guys that I have – that I've talked to that have gone through this all say the same thing. It's terrifying at first and it's the greatest thing they've ever done. And a lot of dudes just simply quit drinking because a lot of combat vets like me try to calm that with, uh, with alcohol and like it or not, it sometimes doesn't work for some people. It does, but I mean, it's obviously very, very important. Drink responsibly when you're going to drink, be be the guy that goes to watch the game, has a few beers and then chills out, you know, but, um, uh, and I know what some people right now are probably thinking, well, you have a, you have a beer company, uh, armed forces brewing company, which is true, but, um, there's going to be a couple new things coming there as well, which I think we can all get on board with. So it's, it's almost like we'll take an about face at some point. Uh, very, very excited. And I appreciate you sticking with me because, um, it is a rough time, but like Tucker said, uh, humility, Brings you back to earth. And, and also, I cannot figure out how to tie that fucking knot that Tucker ties. Have you seen that little guy? Is that a hat? Is that a, like a, a Windsor? What is that one? A half Windsor? No. Half Windsor, I think, is thicker than that. But um, yeah, the, the vets have been cool. I wrote a book called The Way Forward with Dakota Meyer, uh, Marine, Medal of Honor recipient. And um, yeah, he, he's been incredible, man. He, he's just a, he's a, he's a, I consider Dakota a dude that gets it. If you ever find yourself in a, in an alley with Dakota, chances are you're getting into a gunfight based on his history, <laughs> but he usually wins. Uh, but he was cool. He introduced me to uh, to a thing called Vets, Veterans Exploring Therapy Solutions, and check them out. Um, look them up. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna go see them, and uh, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky because I I have a very good support base, which is awesome. Because sometimes it takes some shit like this to come out of the woodwork, but I have a great family, a great wife, and my wife being my wife kindly reminded me that uh you know no one really wants to be around the 47 year old drunk guy like that's not cool anymore um it's she reminded me she said like you know when we go back to butte montana and some of your buddies are still wearing their letter jackets talking about the good old days and eh, thems weren't the good old days and <laughs> he needs to move forward and um i've been able to um to hopefully move forward f- from that too and um, you know we'll see where it goes, but nobody nobody wants to be that guy. Um, I, I've been I've been lucky enough too to um, to to I've been lucky as well to I I did do one pod, podcast uh, in between this thing and then when the the newspaper started rolling my picture, and I didn't really bring it up. But again, I, they're they're working it now. I'm not going to get into it. Um, uh, to give you a little bit of a um a history. Just on 
some of the stuff that that uh, combat vets go through. Uh, part of being around a, again, full responsibility. But uh, I was able to, like I said, give a podcast and I've given two speeches since. And it, it kind of fit into when I tell people that complacency kills. And complacency is caused by success. Too much success, getting stuff lucky or right. And you will have a tendency to say the worst thing you can say is that this is the way we've always done it. You know, I've always pre-gamed. I've always gone out with the boys. I've always had a few drinks at the hotel, and then I try to go to sleep. It may have worked a couple times. It may have worked 99 times. That 100th one, though, boom. Front page news, baby. But I want to take full responsibility, complacency kills. I want to move on from it, uh, learn from it. Hopefully uh, hopefully you can teach me something if you know something. Uh, and if actually, if your comments are good enough, I'll follow you, and you can DM me, and we can figure something out like that, too. But a, a lot of this, what this came from, too, is just an upbringing. You know, co- combat's, combat is combat, and when you're there, you're with your guys. In my, so my, in my situation, um, I was just with my guys, and that was when I was at SEAL Team 6. We had a few missions here and there. Uh, first mission, I think, was in 1998, and we did some stuff that we thought was high speed. And then, you know, right before 9-11, we went to Kosovo. We did some stuff like that, and we thought we were just the greatest shit since uh, since the Vietnam SEAL that said there was about 300 SEALs that fought in Vietnam, and I've met all 20,000 of them. <laughs> uh, the the, the, the old-timers that you you know meet at the reunion and stuff. Um, but then when I, when I started going to no shit combat, that was when I was at SEAL Team 6. And that was a place, SEAL Team 6 was very unique because one of two tier one units in the, uh, in the military. There's us and, and, and uh, Delta. And um, we did, that was normal. What, when I first got to Red Squadron at SEAL Team 6, these dudes had just finished up um, Objective Wolverine, which was after uh, Operation Anaconda when Neil Roberts was killed and, 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 and Chappie was killed. Uh, who should have been speaking of medals of honor, John Chapman, Air Force, CCT. The, okay. The combat controllers in the Air Force are the deadliest men on the battlefield, no doubt about it. Um, and they they okay, I know speaking of getting shit online, combat controllers are the true quiet professionals. They're just bad dudes. People write books about them. <laughs> I had an army guy the other day, we were taking a picture. We had uh, three Navy SEALs and two Army dudes, and, and the, the guy taking the picture was a former Army officer, a pilot, and he said, uh, oh, look, three Navy SEALs and only two authors. <laughs> so that's kind of funny, whatever. But uh, when I was working at SEAL Team 6, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down for you. Just, I mean, not getting into too specific, but if, if, um, if you want me to later, I can. But... Um, we would go, so we would, you know, wake up in the morning. I was very happy because being at a tier one unit, I was fortunate enough to go to work every day with people who were better than me. And so that got me out of bed. That got me fired up. And instead of undermining them when I got to work, which, which for some, again, I I mentioned this earlier, some people just get off on that shit, undermine them, belittle them. What I would do is I would go up to other operators and, uh, look at their gear and ask them why they did that and this, and how about this? And you know, the, 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 they call that Naval special warfare development group for tactical, tactically evaluating gear and coming up with tactics, which we did, but also some guys, really good guys would come up with gear and get us new gear and we would use new shit and we could, we could test and evaluate it. And so we would a normal day, get up, go in, work out. And it was actually cool because it was big boy rules where, you don't need to be there at the, you know, like buds at the 4 a.m. workout when you're getting screamed at and hollered at and uh, uh, you're doing your thousand push ups and all that shit. But, you know, you go in there and it's big boy rules. I'm going to go to the, probably going to go to the, the the gym first, then the range. Then I'm going to shower. Uh, obviously, team meeting, stuff like that. And then some training. Then we all go to lunch together. Well, I mean, mostly, but we're going with other Navy SEALs. And then you come back from lunch and then you do CQB all day, right? So you work on tactics. You work on what makes you better. You work on what did my opponent do the last time we saw him on the battlefield and how do we adjust to, to that and how do we readjust to their adjustments and make sure the, the newer guys that are here uh, get used to this and then, and then talk to the, um, the squadron that just came back from Iraq or Afghanistan or both or Yemen or Somalia, wherever they were. How did each how – did, how did Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula adjust to this tactic? How, how did AQIZ, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, adjust? How did the Taliban do this when you met them in the Shuriak Valley? A- and just getting better. And everything from should we get, it's a higher altitude in some of those places, so maybe we should get, like that's where a lot of the oxygen uh, uh, deprivation training came from. Maybe you can get ready before you're there, trying this out. But you're training all day, always with the guys, then you go out and drink it, right? And so that's a day in the life of being in Virginia Beach. 
Then you go on the road, and let's say, for example, it's uh, skydiving. So you get up, you're, we learned because of process of, well, I hate to say that, but we learned it's better because when we first started, we would do the night jumps at night. We learned though, if you get it, like you can get lost on a jump. If you're doing a high altitude, high opening jump, a hey-ho, and you, uh, that's when you jump out and pull, like you do, a, um, you do a four second count, 1,000, 2,000, look thousand, pull thousand. In my case, I was a, I was a lead jumper. So I do a six count and try to do a track away to, so I could be out in front because the target's that way, whatever. I don't want to get into tactics, but we learned to do the jumps in the morning. So like leave the hotel because we used to stay uh, pretty much downtown Tucson, right by the University of Arizona, uh, just because nice Marriott, nice food, great stuff around there. And then you drive out there about two. You're actually driving past the bars. You, you see the college kids still out. And it's like, God, we got to go do a night jump and whatever. Night jumps are actually f- really cool. They're just fun, man. Uh, the scariest part of a night jump on a hey-ho especially is you're opening pretty close to each other. And if someone screwed up their pack, because there's a couple different ways to pack it, but if you get a shitty opening... Yeah, I mean, we I've had close calls personally where, you know, I almost ram into someone. And if you hit someone at 15,000 feet and you go in the opposite directions at about 25 miles an hour each, um, that's a bad day. Because even if you if you hit body to body, you're going to get ripped in half. And if you hit uh, the lines that connect your buddy to his parachute, you're going to wrap up in what we call a horseshoe malfunction, which is basically two dudes wrapped up in each other thinking about how painful that body part getting cut off felt. And then we get a die when we smack into the mountain type shit. So your head's there. You do, but we, the reason we would, the reason, cause like you see these college kids, like I got to survive an opening and that's it. And then, you know, you, it's, it's beautiful cause you finish your, your jump, your night jump ends well. And then, you know, you pack up, have some breakfast, some coffee, wait for the sun to come up. Then you do a few more jumps, um, with your boys. But the point I'm making it is you're always with your boys. So we do the night jump. That's camaraderie. We do all the j- jump master, um, the JMPI, jump master personnel inspections, um, and then we do the, you know, we're in the thing together, making your shitty jokes because misery loves company. Like the most fun I had at SEAL Team 2, I hated the Tuesday morning ocean swim, but the bus ride to get there was hilarious, especially in February, because this just fucking sucks, but let's do it together. My point is the camaraderie. So we do the night jump during the morning, get some breakfast and coffee, do a couple more jumps, maybe some bundle jumps, a couple tandems. Then we do the fun jumps where we're not wearing the gear. We get to put on the, uh, the catch me, fuck me shoot. Um, your kick ass jumpsuit because we had such good uh, supply reps that were seals that we could fudge a few things. I have a Redskins um, flight suit for air to air camera. I have a green one that pictures out there somewhere. Horrific, horrific. It was the ugliest shit I could find, but, but we had those guys. So we have the fun, do the fun jumps with all that shit. And then you go back, shower up, put your shit on, you go to the Trident, Trident grill on Speedway Boulevard in Tucson. Nelson Miller owns it. Nelson Mil- Miller is one of the finest people on the planet. Former SEAL, former Red Man, former Gold Team. Um, but th- the point I was making was the the tribe that you're with, and that's your culture. And one of our cultures was also when we would get done with these training trips, because not just jumping. We do our training every single day when we're at home. Then we go on trips there. We go on trips to Mississippi for CQB. We stay at home for CQB. We go to different places for military operations, urban terrain. We're training in fake cities, real cities. We're doing realistic urban training. I've been to Portland to do those. Uh, Guys go to Boston, Chicago. Miami was a blast because we could go down to the shady areas of Miami and do live breaching with the Miami police. So the locals, well, some of the locals are like, fuck it, we're used to this. It's Miami. Let's do it. Um, but the, the training trips all the time, and then you go overseas to war. And then when you go to war, you kill people. And in our case, we killed a lot of people. One of the best deployments I ever had was in 2007. And we call that the deployment, the deployment that never was, because our boss was smart enough. I'm going to get him on here. I'm going to interview Rich soon. But he was smart enough to know, because most of our guys went to Afghanistan because our commanding officer decided we could fight the Taliban and they wanted to go to southern Afghanistan, Kandahar, fight those dudes in the mountains with... That's one of those situations where sometimes be careful what you wish for because those dudes are from the mountains and they fight there. But we went to Iraq, a small group of us, and we called it the deployment that never was because every one of the head shed, meaning the, you know, the commanding officer of the whole place and above were in Afghanistan, we had a small group in Iraq. And our boss that was there in, in country said he, he would... He would work for Delta Force. Like, I will answer to that that boss because right now they're doing what's called the awakening. And that's when, so I'm not going to get into the breakdown of what happens, but 
Um, Al Qaeda is Sunni. ISIS is Sunni. And what they're doing is they're going into Sunni areas and they're making Sunni families keep them. And they can't do shit because that's Al Qaeda and ISIS or whatever. Do you, they, if they want to stay, they stay. And they're doing the Civil War stuff, realizing they get with the Shia. who They've, they've been at war forever. That's going to make it chaotic, which it did. But if we could convince the locals that we would help them get rid of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they would help us. They did. So we killed people every night because we were getting good information, and the locals in Al-Qaeda were realizing that the, they, the, they actually started calling us, Al-Qaeda was calling us the filthy team with the tattoos on their hands because we would fight in short sleeves or whatever. Some of the snipers didn't even wear body armor because they're going to climb and they're going to blast people. But when I was young, this was normal. It's normal to kill people. It's normal to go into a house and kill people. And sometimes they're with their families. Sometimes they're in bed with their wives, and you still kill them. Um, I, I got to a point, and it seemed normal. It's not normal to do that. It's not normal to kill people, kill people every night. And um, I got to a point with some of this crew, we were killing so many people, we came up with something like, when we go into a room, you have one second to convince me not to. And it was just it. And it, it was a, it was the more kills, the more cool you were. And this is, killing people is not natural. Not for a normal person. But that's how we were thinking. And uh, now those ghosts haunt me. And, um, th- and I'm not the only one that feels like that. A lot of guys feel like that. But the issue is a lot of veterans don't bring that up because they don't want to seem weak. Um, but once you get into a, a normal life, it really haunts you because now you're not going from the kill house to the shower to the ready room with your boys, with your squadron, with other squadrons. Now you're like transitioning <laughs> to the private sector. Hey, to each his own, 2023, you do you, I don't give a shit. But uh, the transition to the private sector, one of my problems was um, I was at SEAL Team 6 for eight years. I'm one of the toughest motherfuckers in the world. Mentally, at least. I mean, I know dudes that could kick my ass, whatever. But mentally, I can handle this. So that's what I thought about the whole, uh, I can handle, um, I can handle just ripping, ripping a, right out of the bottle just to get rid of the pain. But then it just, it, it adds up, it adds up, and you're going to get bit in the ass. So complacency will get you killed. And one of the things I said in combat, especially, um, that because that's the drinking's a shortcut to avoid reality, and taking a shortcut is getting bored. And I would tell people, don't die because you got bored, do everything like you do anything. So, fix yourself means the buck stops with you, and you need to admit when you're at fault. And, and even if it's quietly to yourself, you need to admit if you're lying to yourself, and if what you're doing in the dark is hurting you or hurting someone else. If there's nothing wrong with asking for help when you need it. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to go get help. I got a great crew. I'm really excited. Uh, I don't have any idea what to expect, but I'm going to keep you posted on this mission. And I will let you know how it goes, and I can't wait to hear what you think about it. What? Hey, what I forgot to mention, because I'm kind of bouncing around again, as per SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. Uh, the... <laughs> The reason that we started doing the night jumps at 2 and 3 in the morning is because, not that you will, but if you lose a jumper, a lot of stuff can happen. Um, Like I mentioned earlier, slight malfunctions where you might need to cut your main parachute away or um, something like that, or or even like something as, as simple as line twists. Which are not always simple, by the way, because that's something where, you know, there's, there's, there are techniques to deal with um, low speed and high speed malfunctions. But if you get caught up looking to get rid of your low speed malfunction for too long, you're still dropping. And the, I mean, I always tell people the nice thing about skydiving is no matter how bad it goes up there, you're going to land. So pay attention to what you got. But it can you can lose some out to do. I've actually got a friend that on a no kidding jump in Afghanistan – he uh, he had a malfunction. He had to go away from the stack, and he actually tore his ACL by himself on a mountaintop in Afghanistan, which is scary as shit. Because it, it, if you find yourself alone on a mountain in Afghanistan, yeah, you, you got to have your shit together. Fortunately, this was probably the most squared away guy we had, 
in the entire squadron, and he was able to try, you know, triangulate his position and get his radio out and make comms, and they got him. 20 CL, though, that's tough. But uh, he was good. He came out of that. Uh, but that can happen. It can happen in training. We've had guys die in training, and it sucks. I mean, training's hard. But like I said, we're all together all the time, and that's what we do. Uh, but the reason that we did the jumps at 3 in the morning or 4 in the morning is if you lose someone like that and he lands somewhere else or um, you know, in the farmer's field or somewhere in a different mountain, in training, you have all day to look for him. So as opposed to losing him, like say you do a, a jump when the sun goes down uh, and you lose him at night, well, you have to wait for the sun to come up before you can see. Not that you can't see with night vision, but it's easier in the day. We found that out plus... Your first jump is in the dark. Your second jump is going to be when the sun's coming up. And if you, I mean, if you haven't done a skydive yet, do it. Go get a jump. Go get a tandem. Have someone else, have a tandem master give you a tandem jump and it'll change your life. You'll love it. And then if you get good at it, I highly recommend a, uh, like a dawn jump when the sun's coming up. Uh, the sunset jumps are great too. We've done those before. But if, like I said, if you have a malfunction and get lost, um, that's a bad day. We've actually we've done uh, morning jumps into the Grand Canyon, which was awesome. That's just cool too. Uh, good stuff there. Always trying to get better at our tactics. We would we would sometimes land on uh, um, mountain tops on right next to cliffs, landing uphill. There's only one way to go, and sometimes you just have to go crosswind. You never want to go downwind, but sometimes you have to go on uphill. It sucks. We, you know, we're jumping experimental parachutes with experimental people. <laughs> it's just a uh, who, but that's what we did. In, we did the jumps in the morning, so that um, you, you have all day to find the guy. So, but so that's what I was getting at. And then um, I talked a little bit about what went on in Texas. Took a week off. Uh, for, you know, Frisco, Texas was awesome too because I was able to stay in an area where the Cowboys train, where the Dallas Cowboys headquarters is. And I grew up a Washington Redskins fan, which I mean, which is to say, I wanted them to beat Dallas every time. It's not hatred for the Cowboys, but. Um, even if you do have hatred for the Cowboys, if you get a chance to go to like the Cowboy Club or or even um, one of the games or stadiums, gorgeous. I, I had the chance to do a uh, Thanksgiving. I brought my uh, my brother and and his daughter to Thanksgiving in the in, in Jerry Jones' suite at Cowboy Stadium. And I'll tell you what, between the colors, um, the 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 classy organization, it's really tough to not like them. So that was interesting. I was able to see that when I was down there. That was a lot of fun being in, being that was fun up to that point. And then we had our stuff go down that I won't get into, but then we took a week off and I went up to Cape Cod to relax, well to relax, to relax and play golf. So while I'm golfing is not relaxing because that's a difficult game that I'm pretty sure not everyone's good at, but we went up there and did that. And also we um I brought a Moink box, my Moink box up there. And I've talked about Moink before and if you haven't checked it out, I'm telling you, you need to check it out. The bacon alone is worth it, but the pineapple jalapeno sausages, all that stuff. Um, Moink is, um, I like Moink because I know where it comes from. My, the meat comes from, and, and with Moink, uh, it's from small family farms across the country. You can help save the family farm and get access to the highest quality meat on earth when you join the Moink movement today. And you'll notice with a lot of these crazies around um, the world, one of the things right now is they want to control the food supply. And China owns a lot of the food supply. And for, they're, they're, they're bringing this ridiculous climate change arguments with cow farts or, or whatever. And they're trying to take meat. Like 60% of U.S. pork comes from China. One company run by China. Um, and I love Moink because, it, it, I mean, it is the best meat I've ever had. That's all I'm going to have. And uh, it's actually helping to save the uh, r save rural America, save the farmers. They're trying to get. They're trying to move us all into cities. You get rid of that. You, you don't realize how much the Midwest actually takes care. The cities aren't producing their stuff. The farmers are. But uh, I do love Moink. You will too if you check them out. Um, you can help keep the American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash the operator right now. And listeners of this show will get free ground beef. For a year, so the free—I mean, the ground beef's insane. The steaks are insane. The pork is awesome. The 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 wild caught salmon is just awesome. Um, and this is one year of the best ground beef you'll ever taste, but it's for a limited time. So it's spelled M O I N K box dot com slash the operator. That's moinkbox dot com slash the operator. I think it's great because uh, moink moo oink cows beef moinkbox dot com slash the operator a year. 
a free ground beef. And you can go through and you can change your uh, order every time. So you can get your uh, the ribeyes, the fillets, the strips, um, and the bacon. They, and all that it's all it's natural. It's 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 pasteurized the way that uh, you know our grandparents farmed. They use salt and pepper. Boom. That's it. Try moinkbox.com slash the operator. Best meat you'll ever have. And also, um, I, I did say that I don't want to oh, start talking trash, start being negative. So I'm not going to, at least on this episode right now. Um, but I mentioned climate change a second ago and how they're saying the cows are bad too. And then obviously, I don't have time to get into what this administration is doing with the land up in Anwar, up in uh, Alaska, as far as the laws that were passed by Congress to drill for cleaner energy than anyone else is putting out. But the, the, this administration canceled all of it. They have, they have basically um, unelected bureaucrats breaking the law, saying that uh, you know in order to get to net zero, it's for the greater good. And that's like the big plan with uh, these bureaucrats. You can get people like the Department of the Interior. They're not elected. They're appointed. And they're making laws. The EPA is making laws. And uh, a lot of these policies, because because of the energy policies, uh, interest rates go up on mortgages. It affects everyone. It hurts ordinary people, and it uh, empowers governments. And then I heard a thing today that next year, um, food stamps are going to cost $250 billion. So that's food stamps for people that aren't working. And not that people don't need a hand up, but um, you know, if you're going to get paid to do nothing, why, why would you do anything? And that's... Um, when when you, they're, they're they're like one and a half jobs for every one person uh, that that is, can do a job that's like physically able, but they're going to leave the workforce to get their free food stamps because some people just don't want to work, and that increases the prices of groceries. Inflation go up. Uh, the, uh, the the gallon. We're not going to dr- be drilling, and uh, Saudi Arabia is going to cut back, and Iran's there. We're helping Venezuela and, and Russia, and that. What do you think that's going to do? That's going to increase the price of everything for everyone, and it's just not. Um, it ain't cool. And you're seeing right now a lot of these. I've always said, too, and I've actually heard people steal this from me, that uh, you're going to get killed because of climate change um, policies long before climate change. And what, maybe next time we'll go into some of that stuff about the, um, the, 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 I don't know even how many, there's a lot of scientists out there that are saying, yeah, stuff does change, but this is not a crisis and we certainly shouldn't be scaring the shit out of children to the point where they don't even want to have kids because they don't want them growing up in a ball of fire, whatever. But the, a lot of these policies, they're, they're seeing, look at illegal immigration. Look at that, that, that whole policy with uh, just let them in and be nice and be kind and all this good stuff. And that's what they're doing. And now all of a sudden you got Mayor Eric Adams in New York saying, well, we can't handle this. And it's going to raise the prices of everything. And we can't afford this. We got to school them. We gotta, and then he blames uh, uh, Governor Abbott from Texas where it's not the lack of a wall or the governor who happens to bus illegals to New York. It's the policies. The people know how to get people want to come here. When they when they come here, they know they're gonna get free shit. They they know they're gonna be they're gonna be just fine. And and uh and because you gotta okay. The reason that's happening is because Democrats think they can get more votes. If they'll vote Democrat if they uh if they let these people cross and they start letting them vote, and that's that's where it starts. But then you start to see the effects of it, like in the schools in New York and in different cities, and now all these ma- like this is basically United Democrats together on the side of the right, as far as well we can't handle this. Well, no, we can't handle this, and so um, this is hurts a lot of this will eventually hurt everyone, and fantasies aren't going to um. They were, they're not, the truth's going to win. We've talked about telling the truth. The truth's going to win at the end. So what I'm getting at is that uh, we are teetering on the brink of an economic meltdown that's threatening to wash away your savings and your retirement. Inflation has surged to levels unseen in 40 years. Prices are spiraling out of control. Our money buys less and less. And Americans are incurring debt, more and more debt just to stay afloat. People are using their credit cards. Your budget... You budget your expenses carefully, but each trip to the grocery store feels like a wallet-pinching experience. Gasoline prices, like I said, are spiking. Your monthly bills, everything will be affected when the price of fuel goes up. And this is what inflation is, and it's that simple. Like The, the Inflation Reduction Act is simply a Green New Deal with a you know lipstick-on-the-pig type thing. And um, 
That's what's happening in this the silent evil force that wants to eat away your wallet and your purchasing power. Basic necessities are now unattainable luxuries. And when prices spiral out of control, they not only disrupt your ability to live day to day, they jeopardize your savings and retirement. Know this. As your living expenses rise higher than the income that your retirement savings can generate, you will eventually run out of money. You're going to run out of money, and then we're going to run out of other people's money. Do not let this happen. Protect your retirement with gold. Gold is the smartest and most responsible investment you can make for you and your family. It's a safe haven asset that protects your purchasing power and your wallet from inflation. Take it from me. It's just financially smart for all of us to diversify our retirement accounts with gold and protect what we've worked so hard for. When it comes to protecting your IRA or 401k, I would only trust the best. And those are my friends at Allegiance Gold. Allegiance Gold has earned the highest trust ratings in the precious metals industry and builds relationships based on integrity, expertise, and impeccable service. So get a load of this. Get up to five thousand dollars in free silver on a qualifying purchase when you visit protectwiththeoperator.com visit protectwiththeoperator.com today or give them a call at 844-790-9191 don't wait take control of your retirement today call allegiance gold at 844-790-9191 and speak with one of their experts they'll answer all of your questions and help you get started on the path to a more secure and prosperous retirement. Time is of the essence, though. Get on this. Protect your future with Allegiance Gold by visiting protectwiththeoperator.com, or again, their number is 844-790-9191. But yeah, it, uh, a lot of times, especially when dealing with the internet, it comes back to politics. And with politics comes uh, the, the damn climate change thing, too. That's like a religion uh, would be, I think it would be nice if you just had people tell the truth. Uh, it seems to me, and I could be out of line here, that uh, everyone is either following the almighty dollar or they're just trying to stay in power. And so they're willing to do whatever will get them one or both. And... Uh, a lot of the hardcore both ends have their religions that they follow, and <clears throat> climate change seems to be one of them because you can you can control the youth if you teach them about that stuff in school. Because let's be honest, the communists said a long time ago they're trying to get, to control the schools, and in a lot of places, unfortunately, they are. I had a I had a friend of mine actually from Cuba who said uh, Cuba is a communist country, and her son is starting, I want to say, his second year in is it high school? Possibly. I'm getting old, like I said, 47. So <laughs> when I look at people that age, it's like, okay, you could either be in third grade or a senior in high school. I can't tell the difference. But um, So she's from Cuba. Her family's from Cuba. And his, her son went into, I don't know if they call it social studies. They definitely don't call it civics anymore. And they're trying to teach kids the best. The point is, she's from Cuba and... This teacher who's from the Dominican Republic in his, this is at a public school, has a, behind his desk a huge picture of Fidel Castro and of um, Che Guevara and other communists that were just horrible people. I mean, the left loves them for some damn reason. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, we'll get into this later too, but like look up Che Guevara's history on like how he dealt with homosexuals, how he dealt with minorities. Not cool. No, and uh, I don't think anyone w would agree that that's good, but that's that's how they roll. And again, we've been we've been talking for a, a while today about serious stuff, trying to stay positive. So I won't. <clears throat> but that's that's some of the things that come up, and then and then just the way that they convince kids they don't want to have kids, they don't want to have babies because they don't want them to be like I said, born on the sun or whatever they are. And I was thinking, shit, if I have a lot of time on my hands lately, I might I might have a baby or something just to. I mean, they're busy. It's having a baby. If you haven't, is like a, uh, <laughs> it's like signing an eighteen-year mortgage, and uh, the, you know the babies come in all shapes and sizes, and <laughs> sometimes they're planned, and sometimes they're surprises. But uh, um, I need to talk about um, tactical baby gear because I love this site. Uh, I've mentioned before the war has rules, and babies don't. Dirty diapers, screaming fits, sleepless nights. Parenthood is not for the faint of heart. I know. 
from experience, and I'm, I might get back into that game just because, uh, you know, having a baby around us, I can argue with them, and they can't really say much back, and I'm bigger than they are. But uh, Tactical Baby Gear was founded by parents for parents with a kit that will make you proud uh, to carry it. And you'll overcome every spit-up, blowout, and meltdown along the way. Prepare for whatever parenting leads you to with everything cool. Uh, the one I talk about a lot, too, are the new white pouches. And um, you've seen them in, in Tactical Baby Gear's E&E kits, but uh, people want more wipes. And you do, do need a lot of wipes because they run out pretty quickly. And if for some reason, the, the poo doesn't. But uh, babies are unpredictable. Eight wipes per resealable pack, and you can get them in 10 pouches per pack for 5 bucks. So um, complete diaper bag kit, seven different mod panels, all kinds of cool stuff, tactical totes, packing cubes for everything cool, compartmentalized, keep it real. We talked about gear earlier. This stuff is highly practical, highly functional, extremely high quality, always ready. Diaper bags, berry, baby carrier strollers, wagons, everything in between. The, the strollers are awesome, too, because they got these high-speed wheels if you want to like take them on the beach and stuff like that. Or if you, if you, if you decide you want to take your baby for a dune run, that, that'll be a good workout. Run them up the dune, these... Uh, these wheels can take it, and it's a lifetime warranty. Uh, when you go to tacticalbabygear.com, the code to use is the operator to save 15% off already reasonable prices for this high-speed tactical gear. It's really badass. It looks really cool. I love the stickers, too. I love how it's got the, uh, I would say Velcro, but it's called hook and pile tape because that's how we roll it. It's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not monkey bars. It's, it's a, it's a um, parallel ladder or some shit like that. Anyway, um, tacticalbabygear.com. What I was getting at with the hook and pilot tape is they have stuff that's like mommy, daddy. I think they have grandma stuff. If they don't, they should. But use code the operator to save 15% at tacticalbabygear.com. Just go check it out. Even if you're buying gifts for someone else, this stuff is bad to the bone. Tacticalbabygear.com. Use code the operator to save 15%. And no longer will we say don't tread on me. Now we will say don't poop on me. Check them out too on Instagram at tacticalbabygear. God, guns, diapers, baby. So, I want to leave you with a uh, story that I think is <laughs> its just outstanding because thank you social media and thank you politicians and thank you regular media and um, fanatics that refuse to believe the truth and um, you know, I've been in situations before where only I've seen certain things and I know the truth and there's no point in trying to convince someone that wasn't there and didn't see it that uh, here's the truth. If someone doesn't want to believe you, they're just not going to believe you. So um, I was talking to Dakota Meyer about this and he turned me on to the story. And I think it's I think this is fitting because you can stop for a minute and think about this when, whenever you hear someone letting their emotions get the best of them and all they're doing is screaming at you. It was an argument between a donkey and a tiger. And uh, the donkey told the tiger, the grass is blue. And the tiger replied, no, the grass is green. And the discussion became heated. So they, those two decided that they were going to submit the issue to arbitration. So they went and approached the lion. As they went up to the lion on his throne, the donkey started screaming, your highness, isn't it true that the grass is blue? And the lion said, if you believe it's true, then the grass is blue. The donkey rushed forward and continued, the tiger disagrees with me, contradicts me, and annoys me. Please punish him. So that's what the donkey said about the tiger. The king, the lion, then declared, the tiger will be punished with three days of silence. So the donkey jumped up with joy and went on his way, content and repeating, the grass is blue, the grass is blue. So he ran off. He's all happy. And the, the tiger looked at the lion and said, your majesty, why have you punished me. After all, the grass is green. And the lion said, you've known and seen that the grass is green. The tiger said, so why did you punish me? And the lion said, that has nothing to do with the question of whether the grass is green or blue. The punishment is because it is degrading for a brave, intelligent creature like you wasting time arguing with an ass. On top of that, you came and bothered me with that question just to validate something you already knew was true. That's a pretty good story right there. And the biggest waste of time in arguing with a fool and fanatic who doesn't care about the truth, but only um, the victory of his beliefs and illusions, even though they're not right. They just want to, they want to win. And uh, so never waste time on discussions that make no sense. 
There are people who, for all the evidence presented to them, do not have the ability to understand. Others who go blindly by eager hatred and resentment. And the only thing that they want is to be right, even though they aren't. So, <laughs> you can be the donkey if you want, and you can be the tiger, and you can get in that argument, or you can be the lion. But if you're the tiger and the lion, remember, you're never out of the fight. 